There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello, Booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel and another episode of Zooming In, where I engage with bookish social media luminaries the world over to talk about bookish literary readerly articles online. And what a pleasure and honor it is to welcome for his debut appearance, not only in this series, but on my channel, Daryl from Montreal and of Instagram <laughs> fame. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you for having me. I'm really happy so to be here. It's so great to finally meet you. Yeah, and same to you. We're here to talk about an article that was published on Book Riot in early November. It is called Better Know an Author, The Joys of Reading Author Catalogs in Publication Order. It's written by Laura Sackton. And I think the word catalogs is a little bit confusing, but basically a, an author's yeah. works yeah, works in, in publication order. So I found this a fascinating article, and I have some experience with this. What did you make of the article, Daryl? Well, I mean, there were a lot of interesting points there. And I mean, a lot of things that I had thought about in the first place, too. One of the things I really liked the most about the article explaining how great that process is, is growing with the author. And sometimes, like, I feel it's, it's fascinating, too, to see, like, what an author was when, in their youth or when they first began. Sometimes you could see maybe the maturity. Sometimes there is no maturity. Sometimes they keep doing the same thing over and over again. It's very fascinating to see that. But the article was point, pointing it in a way that made it seem like we were also there with the author on their journey. And I love that concept. I love that idea. I feel as readers... Like, I mean, we tend to read um, books, you know, and have the author in the back of our mind in a way, but to suggest it in that way, we're along with the journey, kind of gives a little bit more of an intimate, intimate feel with the author. So I liked that. And I was racking my brain an hour ago trying to think of contemporary writers, writers who are still writing today that I have done this with, but now it's, uh, some have come to me just as I was listening to you talk, and one of them would be Michael Cunningham. Okay, yes. I think I... With the exception of his first novel, Golden States, which mm -hmm. he has disavowed so in intensely, so extremely that he, oh, has he, he if, yeah. if, if there's a copy of it in a used bookstore, he will buy it and burn it. I do did uh -huh. used to have a copy. I think I still do. Never read it. But then from then on, with uh, At Home at the End of the World, I think I've you been reading that one. Copy. So, yeah. Tell us, oh, and I was also going to say, you talked about some writers who don't mature, and I'm going to wait until you and I have both um, <laughs> had, a, had a drink before I ask you to name names. <laughs> well, I, you know, as I said that, though, I'm not even sure if I could think of it off the top of my head, but hopefully during the discussion, I will be able to. Well, or I won't. I, I certainly won't put you on the spot. No, um, no, no. I, I'll buy you do. a beer first. <laughs> <laughs> so who have you done this with? Yeah, well, I have done this with David Mitchell. Um, that was a goal of the like goal for me last year. So last year I did a post. Actually, in fact, I was supposed to do this with John Steinbeck and William Faulkner like years ago, but I never did it. So one day I decided like, okay, you know what? I really do want to do this. I have done this with other authors, but never consciously. So okay. last year I was throwing around some authors, Cormac McCarthy, Toni Morrison, like, you know, all these different people. And I decided with David Mitchell, number one, because I had never read anything by him compared to the other authors that I had thought about. I had read at least one from them. So I thought it would be fascinating. And this is actually something I want to talk about with you later. What do you think about um, if you read an author like where you choose an author to read, but you've never read anything from them and doing it in order? Or if when you read a book from them, you decide to then do that project of going back in time. We'll talk about that later, if that's okay with you. But yeah, oh, so in, yeah, but in this case, I, I wanted to do David Mitchell because I had never read anything from him. But also too, he was an intimidating writer to me because he's very genre bending. I didn't really know how I was going to get along with that. It was a little scary for me at the same time. And in my mind, I had an idea. I wanted to read Cloud Atlas, but I was like, let's see how he first got yes, there. Sir. But the thing that for me, that's very fascinating with 
him as an author versus other people that you would do this with is because his books are in conversation with one another. Because even though the plot is like very different and it's not telling you that they're connected, there's little tidbits and different like Easter eggs in ways where characters from previous books pop up into a different book or sometimes an event that happened in a previous book is sort of mentioned there. So I think in his case, it actually was a very fun experience because there's that added element. Like if you read, let's just say Toni Morrison, you're not gonna get that, right? It's, they're all individual books. You could maybe pick up on themes that recur or different ways of telling that kind of story. But David Mitchell was actually fun because of the idea of like recurring characters, recurring plot points and things like that. Now I did not complete this project. It was ambitious. I had the eight books to read. I only did the first three, but then life got a little bit crazy. So I want to actually continue this next year where I finish the other five. But yeah. Well, and this the spin I would put on that is that you're not complete you haven't finished it yet. No, I have not you finished, have it yet. finished it yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're still young. You've got lots yeah. of time. <laughs> well, um, what about you? Yeah, I think the only one that I did that was intentional that I wanted to start with her debut and then I as long as I loved it, which I ended up loving it, that I would continue to read her in publication order, and that was Barbara Pym. Oh yeah. I have not read anything. I was introduced to her from the former bookish podcaster and still book blogger extraordinaire Thomas of Hogglestock.com. He used to be with Simon Savage on The Readers many years ago, and he used to always talk about Barbara Pym. So I decided I'm going to start her debut, and if I like it, I'm going to keep going in publication mm -hmm. order. And I did exactly that. I read her complete works. And that was maybe a similar experience, or she's a, in a way a similar kind of writer. This is probably the only thing that's similar between the writing of Barbara Pym and David Mitchell, but <laughs> that uh, characters would kind of pop up in other books. Like the main character in this book might just be sitting across from the main character in the next book and you recognize exactly. them. And she even put herself in cameo roles in certain scenes and books. And that was really fun to track across books. Okay. And there was a exquisite, absolutely delightful sameness about the first five or something of her books. Very yeah. comedy of manners, kind of a, a really uh, not quite campy, but almost campy take on Jane Austen themes That's set funny. in the 20th century among spinsters and uh, widows and so on, and just hilarious. But also underneath that hilarity, a sense of single women in this era or maybe any era, but certainly in her day, or the day of the yeah. characters, um, mm -hmm. a yearning for connection that was really quite uh, literally pathetic, like really quite moving. And then, I think her second last novel that might have even been the last novel she wrote, the publication order was a little bit wonky, because some mm -hmm. of her books were published posthumously that she'd written 50 years before. But um, one of her last novels had almost no humor in it and was just about sad, lonely old people. And it was jarring for me. And it was an almost completely different kind of book. And by the time I got to the end and thought about it for a day, I thought, oh, this is one of her best books. Oh, so okay. she wasn't samey, samey, samey. She, she actually wrote her way into a very different kind of novel. And so I okay. really appreciated that journey. Other writers and... Uh, most of my examples are uh, British women writers kind of of the mid-20th century. That's one of my specialties. Right. Is that I'll read one novel and I'll love it. And then I'll say, okay, I'm going to go back to the debut and work my way through them, the rest of them in chronological order. And that's happened with Rosamund Lehman. Okay. I read one of her later novels that was really wild and a crazy plot about a love affair between a husband and his sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to the, how did this woman write her way into such a crazy story that was profoundly psychologically taught and really <laughs> in, engaging? How did yeah. she get here? So I went back to her debut and I've now read her first two books, start her third one next year. Fair. And that also happened with Elizabeth Jane Howard, another British novelist. I have not um, read. Read 
her second novel first and loved it so much, went back to the first and, and went buddy the reading first. them back. back, to back. Yes. Okay. So David Mitchell was your writer that you said, I'm going to read his works and publication yeah. work. Have you done that with anybody else? Well, this is where I said in the, earlier on that this was the one I intentionally did, right? So like I do have other authors that I want to do that with. And in his case, because like I said, with him, I had never read anything. I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, but there are other authors where I have read something and now I want to go back and start it. But mm. when I looked it over, I do realize that one is Toni Morrison, where I did end up doing this without really quite realizing that's what I was doing. And then when I reflected back on it, I realized what an exhilarating experience that is. And perhaps that might be even how I came up with the idea of wanting to do a project like that. I'm not sure. But in Toni Morrison's case, it was just uh, a random thing. Uh, I My parents are from Trinidad and we had gone on vacation. And the bluest eye happened to be in my aunt's library and I just picked it up on a whim. I had a friend who all the time kept telling me, read Toni Morrison, the, the things that you're into, you're going to love it. And I, I don't know why I dismissed her work in my mind thinking that's so not something I'm going to be into. I don't know why I thought that. So I picked it up and I read it. And then I ended up um, reading like Sue Laughter and this and that. And it kind of went in a particular order. And it's only afterwards I looked at realizing that I read it in order of publication. And even as I kept reading her, I was noticing like a change. I was noticing like a maturity without really picking up on the fact that her books were in publication order. So she's an author where that just ended up happening. Oh, James Baldwin's the other one that I, that that happened with. So James Baldwin though, his, I ended up reading one of his books, though, for school, and it wasn't the debut. And then I ended up reading his books, and coincidentally, they ended up being in a lot of order. And as you had a story about, like, Barbara Pym and stuff like that, um, I'm going to mention what James Baldwin is. Well, the first book that I ended up reading from him was Another Country, right? Which I think up till this day is still my favorite of his, maybe because it was the first. But then afterwards, I decided to read his first and go into that order but that wasn't even a conscious thing really to be quite honest at the end I realized that's what I did as well but for him he always has I love all like most of his books I'll say most I'm going to be very honest there's one I don't like but his books have this sort of quality that's like it's musical lyrical readable it also sort of excites you in ways because of the different ways that he tackles the sort that subject. And he's way ahead of his time, in my opinion. Like when it comes to especially a lot of the homosexual related themes and stuff like that, way ahead of his time. So when I went back though to read his first one and his first one has no, like there's no queer themes in it at all. It's like from a religious standpoint, I'll go tell it on the mountain. It was very jarring for me because You know, you go through all your life hearing that he's a pioneer in queer literature and this and that. And then to read that, it's it's just jarring because you didn't think that he had that kind of work in his pedigree. Um, Although I love that book. It's outstanding, very good on like spiritualism as well, too. And I'm not the most spiritual person, but it worked. So, yeah, so I read all like his books happened to be in that kind of order. Now, when at a certain point I realized that I was reading them in order... A lot of his later books, and I'm only talking about novels with him. I completed all his novels, not like all his short stories or essay collections or anything like that. The fascinating to me with him is that he lost a bit of his energy, vibe, if you want to call it that, to me at least in his later works, where in the earlier books, they had like this more potent, raw kind of feel to them that you can like feel the passion on the page. You could feel the rage off the page. It just has that quality. And I found in the later ones, it almost, I don't want to say that it was redundant. It feels almost in a way blasphemous to say that about James Baldwin. But this is sort of how I felt. I just felt like, you know, there are some authors where their earlier stuff is just their stronger work. And then afterwards it becomes not monotonous, but it's a little bit like samey, more of the same, I've seen this before and done better before. 
But when I got to his spinal book, which is just above my head, that was fascinating to me because, okay, I don't know the backstory of how that book came about. I honestly have not researched to see if it was published like after he died, if it was published while he was alive, like I'm not really sure. But it almost seems like he put his legacy into that book, like it's a swan song. Because every element from all of his books from before are in that book, but in a more messy, sprawling, I'm really going to go for it type vibe. And I love that. And it, it just kind of made me think like, okay, you know, all these later books that I was sort of feeling had less energy to them, less spontaneity, less something interesting to dissect or talk about. He kind of shut me up when he wrote that last one because it just, I don't know. I just found it very, very fascinating how he managed to take like all different elements. You could pick up on so much of the different things from each of his books before. This is why I find it so interesting that that was his final book. I don't know if that was intentional or not, like when it comes to novels. I mean, even in that book, you pick up on a lot of the essays that he wrote. So I've read some of his essays and I love them. And his essays have even harsher feel to them too because it, it's like he's not placating anyone like when he's writing nonfiction. but even in this final novel it has that kind of raw frenetic kind of dizzying energy to it and I love that so for me like if I even wanted to make a suggestion to somebody I would say like go with James Baldwin because you'd be very surprised in the end to see how someone's it, it's almost like his work is perfect as a whole. Like when you look at it as a whole to see his beginnings where he may be not, maybe he wasn't even comfortable in mentioning queer themes to suddenly now this raw, and, and his last book, to be quite honest, in my opinion, it's, it's amazing, it's great, but it's an imperfect book. And that's what also makes it very fascinating as well is because it's imperfect. It's, it feels very, like I just had to get this all out on the page. Like, I just had to get this all out there, whether it's fine-tuned or, you know, anything like that. And I, I just love that. So that's, a, that's an author. That was a long, convoluted way of saying that I did that with James Baldwin as well. But without you, say convol- you say convoluted and I'll say passionate. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, and I, mean, I have two thoughts about that. One is that somebody who hadn't read most of or all of his previous work might have a very different experience of his final book than you did. But that's one of the joys of doing this is that you are carrying uh, to the best of your ability. You're carrying all the other books with you when you approach that final book. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And the other thing, and this is kind of a separate thing, and I don't want to digress too long. I also wonder about... I'd love to see somebody do a study of this. Do readers, when when readers read the complete oeuvre of a author, do they connect more with the book that the author wrote when they were of a similar age no. to the reader when they read it? So in other words, some of James Baldwin's books that he re- wrote later in life, might you connect with them when you were when you're the age he was when he wrote okay yeah no i yeah i can see that i mean that is something that's a a good question to in general when it comes to books too is that i do a lot of revisiting in fact in mid-december until the end of the year i always reread that's just something i do so i revisit books and to answer your question i mean we're talking about james baldwin in um like here in this case but in general when it comes to reading revisiting a book at a different stage in your life it's a completely different take that you get like a completely Mm -hmm. different perspective things have changed in your life and you realize that so sometimes i don't know if you know this about me but i'm considered the ranking king in the sense that i always have to rank books always whether it's the books i've read in a year whether it's authors books like what i feel is the best to the whatever but i mean i guess we're to be quite honest to answer your question it is subjective because can I really definitively say this was a bad book or a good book? Maybe it was just at the wrong place in my life. Maybe you have to have more life experience to suddenly realize 
where the author was going with something or what they were feeling in that moment or to experience something like that. It's the same way too as when you get older and you look back at some books, whether it's whether it's could be even a contemporary book that comes out. And let's just say it's not from your age group and it's like a young set and you kind of roll your eyes or you feel sort of this jaded look at that because you're kind of like you can't connect to that and stuff. But I guess in a way too, you have to think back at like when I was is that age when that book was written, would I have connected to it? Is it just because I have a lot more life experience now that I find a juvenile? So, you know, it, it keeps going Absolutely. back and forth. And Absolutely. I agree with you completely. Maybe if I revisit James Baldwin 10 years from now, 20 years from now, some of those books might hit me in a completely different way. And maybe some of the ones that I loved before might hit me a lot less. Very interesting. And Doing this completest project, reading a, an author in publication order, is a way to explore these questions and experience them on a deeper level. So it's wonderful. The last thing that I will say is sometimes it happens organically because I read a writer's debut and I love it. And so then I'll read the next book and then I'll read the next book. And as long as I keep loving them, I'm doing the same project with a yeah. with a newer, younger author. And uh, the one that yes. I can think of that I'm doing that with is Rowan Haseo Buchanan. Do you know her books? No, I do not. Her, uh, well, you're giving you, me some I, interesting things to read. I, I think you'd like her. I well, I'm always like open to everything, as you've probably realized. She is a, a queer British-American writer, but her ethnic background is almost every um, ethnic background you could imagine. You can imagine. It's fascinating in that way. And Harmless Like You was her debut in 2016. Harmless and then I, Like You. And then her second one was Starling Days 2019. And I love that. I have her third yeah. one, The Sleep Watcher, on my shelf. I haven't got to it yet, but yeah. he's one that I'm doing in publication orders because I, I love everything she's written so far. So, yeah. You hit on a point, and I had thought about this even before our video, is that. Yeah. I do believe that like when the article was talking about oh, these different things about reading in publication order, the thing is, I think a lot of people are actually doing this because books nowadays, you can do that. And we're, and because of bookstagram, YouTube and all these things that didn't really exist back in the day type thing, it's in people's consciousness, like all the time, these new books. So it's easier for people to now follow an author like they read the debut and then they can't wait for the new one that comes out so I think a lot of people are actually doing this as we speak it's more of the older writers and the writers and, past generations and stuff like that where it becomes exactly. more difficult but the thing is though it, it is fascinating in ways that the our generation now because of books being pumped so much out there is actually making people do this project as we speak just because it's just happening in real time. You know what I mean? So this is where I pretend I'm much younger than I am and I drop the the <laughs> verb autobuy into the conversation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Daryl, I could yeah. talk to you all day, but I guess we yeah. we probably should go for now. What a wonderful guest. Will you come back? Of course I will. This was amazing. This was so much fun. And you're very easy to talk to. So Well, I, I thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.